Hey, welcome back, everybody. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day. This is Wicked Sources. I'm your host, Mike, broadcasting from LA. And every week I bring you news info that could affect you. Today, we're going to talk about Kratom and their strains and their various names. For years, I've gotten this question and I've had my suspicions about it. So, we're going to dive into some of these names, some of these strains, and some of the details behind it in this segment, which is called Wicked Questions Answered by Me. So if you find some value, smash the like for the algos. Subscribe if you want to stick around for more like this. All right, so for years, I've been asked this specific question of what's the difference? It's understandable that people may not really know when they first come into it. I've been involved with Kratom for about a decade now. Back then, there weren't many strains. I think the the main one was Mangda. Uh, But as time progressed, in a few short years, we had three more added to the list, white, red, and green. So when people come in for the first time and they're like, hey, I discovered Kratom and I want to try it. I'm like, cool. My first questions are usually, well, what's your expectation exactly? because um, if I have a better understanding of that, then I can help um, thoroughly. Once we have established that, then we figure out, well, do you want capsules or powder? And then we can dive into the differences. So generally, most people will do a lot of research online. That's very common. They'll hop on the internet and go through Reddit threads and see what they can learn about it before they eventually discover me and want to come in and speak to somebody who's been doing it a while. So um, I did do some research and I discovered a few different links here that were rather interesting. Um, In three different pieces, we have one that describes different names and different strains, and then another page that has descriptions of what they're supposed to be like and dosage, which is illegal. We're not supposed to give dosages, according to the FDA. And then a third one where uh, scientifically there's been a lot of um, research done, a lot of studies done, and um, it talks about how there's a very good likelihood that none of it is even true. All right, so we have this first one here, top nine strains according to this website called onlinekratom.com. So we have Bali, pain relief and sedative properties, Mangda, mood enhancing, stimulation, red vein tie, euphoric and pain relieving, white vein tie, strong stimulant, green vein Borneo, balanced mental stimulation. The next one, we have some of these here, Bali, an ideal balance of pain relief and energy boost. Mangda, energizing and stimulating with pain-killing effects. Red Bali, similar to Bali with some red characteristics. Red Vein Thai, similar to Bali with a more classic red strain effects. Sedating and more classically opiate-like, that's the Red Vein Cali, which I've never heard of. Um, To the right, you'll notice here that these are suggested doses and they're all pretty similar. I guess this is all for you know, people who are discovering it for the first time, starting anywhere between their half to uh, three teaspoons. Now, all of these descriptions here sound very similar. So what's really the difference between all of them? That brings us to the truth about strains. And this is a company that deals in um, importing, testing, and... Um, dealing with overseas um, suppliers and farmers. So we're going to go through this really quick and talk about what they have discovered over the years. So in it, they say, after six years of medium-scale importing, daily use research that has been gathered both scientific and industry-based, they have discerned that there is little truth or substance to the strains in the Kratom industry. This is something I've suspected for years um, because Again, early on, there weren't many strains, and then when they started adding more and more and more, um, it uh, kind of made me wonder, like, is this just marketing? Who's coming up with these things? It's very similar to the cannabis industry now. Most cannabis are hybrids, though people don't know this. Um, This is because of crossbreeding over many, many years. So it goes on to say there's, uh, they're providing an in-depth, behind-the-scenes look at Indonesian manufacturing practices. 
So they break down the science that is currently available on strains by educating people like yourself and like myself so that we can avoid low quality kratom. So as they continue to learn more about the industry and the science available, they will continue to update us. So they have come to learn that there may be some truth to the consensus that green are more stimulating and reds are more sedative. People also believe the same goes for, let's say, white vein and Meng Da. Contrary to this popular belief, um, it is not because reds have more sedative properties just because it does. It just happens to show that the 7-OH levels are higher, and this is very likely that fermenting increases a certain chemical that induces relaxing effects. So none of us have heard this before, and this is why it's important to talk about what these differences are. The first fallacy most customers believe is that the strains are sourced from different countries, such as Malay, Thai, Vietnam, Bali, suggesting that these leaves are sourced from these uh, different regions or countries. However, nearly all the world's kratom, 99% is sourced from Indonesia, more specifically from the region of Borneo, near the river of Hulu Kapua. The kratom, specifically as an industry, is still unregulated, and um, it's the same here in the States as it is globally. It has been illegal in Malaysia, Thailand, and various other you know parts of the world um, and there's uh, very little or no evidence that suggests um, that uh, kratom is being grown in Vietnam and while in Bali um, yes it's in Indonesia and kratom is legal it's mainly a tourist island it's not a farming island it makes no sense that um, a kratom would be sourced from the island of Bali and there's no evidence that kratom even grows there uh, therefore, all of the Malay and Thai, Vietnam and Bali on the U.S. market are sourced from Borneo. Most kratom suppliers live in a major city in Indonesia, and the leaves are sourced from farms that are from that specific river I mentioned. So this common idea is usually um, has a you know kind of a rebuttal that people who are so-called experts in the industry will come back and say, well, we hear uh, that the strain locations is that the farmers got the genetics from these different countries and then grew them in Indonesia. Considering, again, how widely unregulated kratom industry is, it doesn't make sense to trust anybody who says that. Um, how do we substantiate it? How do we quantify it? How do we know there's truth behind it? There's no authenticity. Uh, the, inter uh, the internet has allowed third world people who own very little to contact American Kratom buyers and broker deals. So even people here in the States who are um, major suppliers to, let's say, um, lower level distribution groups and then retailers, they're usually going through a broker, not even the actual farmer. So why would we trust anybody, let alone the people who are in Indonesia who are the farmers? Uh, so let's get to the actual science that's on the strains through um, scientists who have done the studies. There are red vein leaves, white vein leaves, and green vein leaves. There are also horned leaves that come with all three vein colors. So thus far, scientists have not found uh, noticeable differences in the alkaloid content or the ratio of alkaloids between the different leaf types. Um, this is directly from the scientists who uh, conduct research and are trying to better understand this plant. So when we really look at this industry as a whole, much of it is, I want to say, marketing. They want to show that there's some variations and differences in the products, but all of it's Kratom. Do they have different properties? It makes sense when I hear somebody who tells me, well, you know what? I had Red Vein from this brand and it worked great, but then I tried another brand of Red Vein and I didn't notice anything. So I went back to what I was using. That 
kind of says it all, doesn't it? Why is one working and not the other one working if they're both red vein? Why aren't they producing the same properties? Uh, most people would say this is a biology issue. Everyone's going to react differently to it. I, for a period of time, believed that as well. And there is some element of that. But this makes a lot more sense that the way it's harvested, processed, and then um, depending on what happens in between, if it's fermented like we saw those seven OH levels being higher in some, which are known to actually create more of a relaxing effect, um, there are probably other chemicals that we're not really aware of in terms of the processing um, period. Now, I can say that there is one element that truly matters, maybe two. One being that it's got to be fresh, and that makes a world of difference. And the second one is that they are being lab tested. After all, it comes from overseas. I've said it for many years in my videos that if you're ordering online, you don't know what you're getting. Um, if you're getting kilos for $99, that's questionable. What are they skipping? Because if you're going through re reputable sources and distribution groups, they're buying, you know, thousands of kilos, but they have to test it. Otherwise, if there's any trouble with it, it comes back to them. And that's not good business. That hurts them. That puts them out of business if people are getting hurt or dying. Furthermore, it creates this huge dilemma in the Kratom community because then the FDA feels it necessary to crack down even harder. And I know many of you don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. I have seen it for a decade that um, millions of people are finding benefit from this. As long as you're getting something that's good, that has been tested, there's no heavy metals, pesticides, or any type of viruses, just like the, like the one that we saw in 2016, it was an E. coli outbreak in Kratom, that's um, horrifying. So the first one that I had mentioned was freshness. Think of it this way. It's harvested and processed overseas. That, let's say, takes three months. Then it's uh, packaged in containers and then put on a freight. It has to sail all the way here to the States. That takes another three months, let's say. And we're estimating. I don't know exactly the time frames, but let's just be conservative. So by the time it's harvested and prepared and put on a ship and it arrives here in our ports, it's been six months. Then it's distributed to all the partners. Then it's batch tested and lab tested. Then it's labeled and bottled. Then it's distributed to lower um, distributor groups and then from there to retailers. Let's add another three to six months to that. So it's been six months since it was harvested. That's a lot of time lapse. Now, there are ways to keep it fresh, and that is important. Um, but even, even if, with that in consideration, most Kratom has a shelf life of two years. That's what I have seen. And uh, beyond that, it becomes stale. If you've ever had cannabis and you're not really a big smoker, you've bought cannabis, you'll take a toke or two and then you stash it away and come back a month later, it's not the same. No matter how fresh you try to keep it, it's not the same. It has degraded. The same happens to Kratom. So this is a this is a thought and a concern I've had for a number of years, wondering, well, is there really a difference between the strains? Now, we know there are 25 alkaloids in Kratom, or active ingredients, two of which have been identified by researchers to react in that part of the brain that uh, medications do and many other things that do, chocolate, um, you name it. So the other 23 are doing something as well, and this is where more research is needed. On top of that, depending on how processing is occurring, there's other chemicals that are potentially um, growing in quantity in the actual leaves or the processed leaves themselves, which are effectively creating, you know, different results for different people. Very fascinating. So what do you guys think? Leave them down below. Am I right? Am I wrong to be concerned or uh, be suspicious of these different strains and the different names? The, the names are definitely um, strange, especially 
when we know that most of it is from Indonesia and nowhere else, no other part of the world is growing kratom. The strain aspect of it is also kind of suspicious, but maybe there's a little more science behind that, just like what we read towards the end that the scientists have seen. There are some different um, colored leaves, but to say that their alkaloids are different or that they do different things, they're not seeing that when they're running the science. So I'll catch you guys on the next one. Thank <laughs> you.